so till now we have been looking at uh, problem discretization we transform the problem from original problem which was let us say a boundary value problem or a partial differential equation into a computable form that computable form could be a set of linear algebraic equations linear different or nonlinear algebraic equations the transform form could be OD initial value problem and now we need ways of actually solving constructing the solution. So, I just want to draw the picture that we started with when so we had this original problem this original problem was uh, nonlinear algebraic equations boundary value problems partial differential equations all kinds of things that uh, arise in modeling of engineering systems uh, they could be differential algebraic equations so we have we have different kinds of equations that we need to uh, solve so this is this is coming from your physics this is coming from your modeling transport phenomena uh, heat and mass transfer and so on so this will give you a set of equations <coughs> most of the times these equations are nonlinear not at all amenable to constructing an analytical solution these are in multiple dimensions and you have to solve them using some numerical techniques ok. So, the next step was problem approximation. So, we constructed we used concept of approximation theory and we got this transform problem this is transform computable problem. So, in approximation theory we use three different tools one was uh, Taylor series approximation basically we use polynomial approximations that was one of the fundamental tools but of course we use also function approximations later when we talked about least squares right. So, we had uh, we used concepts of approximation theory to come up with a transform problem. So, here either interpolation Taylor series approximation or these squares these were two uh, these were three uh, basic ideas that were used to transform the problem. Uh, so, I would just list them here is either Taylor series or interpolation. So, Taylor series interpolation or least square approximation. So, these were three predominantly used tools to transform the problem to a computable form and now we want to attack this problem. So, we are uh, and as you could see that this problem which you started with was a partial differential equation you ended up here sometimes with nonlinear algebraic equations sometimes with uh, initial value problem ordinary differential equation. So, you the transform problem from the viewpoint of the uh, structure of equations could be completely different ok. So, it need not be it need not resemble the original problem original problem is a partial differential equation in space and time here you get an ordinary differential equation only in time original problem is partial differential equation in space you just get algebraic equations either linear or nonlinear so transform problem is completely different we hope that if we solve the transform problem we get something close to the true solution not the exact solution now how do you attack the transform problem that is so the next thing is look at the tools. So, I am going to talk about three different tools A x equal to b I would put this as solving linear algebraic equations this is one of the fundamental tools that we are going to use. So, this tool will be used to attack this problem 
well the other one other tool that i am interested is is uh, actually solving f of x equal to 0 so this is another tool which is used to solve the transform problem okay the third tool which i am going to be looking at is od initial value problem initial value problems is again a fundamental uh, fundamental block and uh, euler method runge kutta method all those methods will come under this here we will we will revisit newton's method we'll look at its other nuances and see how you can enhance the convergence and well the fourth tool which is quite commonly used is stochastic methods but i am not going to deal with this okay stochastic methods this is a fourth tool what we expect after that once we attack this problem with these tools or their combinations it's not always that you will use only one tool you might use this and this because newton raphson will require this okay to solve this and so on so uh, their combinations and finally we what comes out is the approximate solution so this is my end result this is my end result so i start with the original problem i use approximation theory come up with a transform problem which is computable i have only 3 4 tools with me which i use ingeniously to con concoct a solution you should get this feel at the end of the course that actually it's like uh it's like a belpuri shop you know you only have few things with you okay and with the same things you can make shev puri you can make dahi batata puri you can make you know bel puri so it's the same thing is the same same ingredients okay and by just making mixtures you can create different dishes the same idea is here that we, we don't have too many tools we don't understand how to solve very very complex equations exactly we just know after all that we have done uh, progress in mathematics we just know how to solve ax equal to b we just know how to solve uh, nonlinear algebraic equations and all these you will realize we know how to solve this approximately we know how to solve this approximately so ultimately the you know what you land up with is a third order approximation you approximate from here to here okay then you try to use these tools but they themselves are approximate okay and then there are errors in uh, computation because of inherent limitations of a computer so all three combined together okay you get a third order approximation which is which you hope is which you hope is the close to the reality what is what the real solution is okay well there are there is one more approximation which i forgot if you if you start with if you start with a real system okay so this is the real process or a system when you write a mathematical model okay that itself is an approximation well when i say that a reactor is like a cstr it is not cstr or when i say it is a pfr it is not a perfect pfr pfr and cstr these are models these are idealized models which try to approximate the reality so from here to here itself there is an approximation what we formulate here we cannot solve exactly so there is one more level of approximation then when you try to attack them using different tools those of those tools are also approximate okay because all these ideas of taylor series then um, polynomial approximation interpolation all these again we will revisit when we are doing this okay so they are not going to leave us because again many of these things are not solvable so you go back to again taylor series you go back to again and then uh, you solve an approximation of approximation and so on so 
you could say it is a fourth order approximation and in between you know you have a computer which is having its own limitations. So, all things put together what you get is the approximate solution. Now, this approximate solution should represent something that is happening in this problem and in the reality and this is where your inputs as engineer or a physicist or a chemist will come into picture. You should make you should know whether this makes sense. Often times you need to actually give a good guess. You must have realized this when you are solving some of the problems numerically which uh, and if you do not give a good guess the solution can be absurd and so giving good guess is where your background in engineering or science is very very critical ok. So, now what we do is we have come up to this point now we look at A, B and C we will not be able to get into stochastic methods hopefully we will be able to cover give up I will be able to do some justice to these three tools. Okay, so let us begin with A x equal to B. And then you might wonder, well, I have been doing this since my 12th standard. So, what more to it? What more to A x equal to B? I have been doing this for ages. Uh, there is a lot more to it. I will at least need 8 or 10 lectures. That too, we will just touch the tip of the iceberg. When you are using uh, or when you are solving problems in uh, school textbooks with some 2 equations in 2 unknowns or 3 equations in 3 unknowns, you know, simple methods work. Uh, well, the most, the, the first thing that you learn is Kramer's rule, right. Now, what, what I will show is that Kramer's rule beyond 4 equations becomes unwieldy. You cannot use it for computer implementation. The most practical method is of course, Gaussian elimination, again credited to Prince of Mathematics Gauss. Uh, this method uh, is probably one of the most efficient methods of directly solving linear algebraic equations. Uh, but then again these methods will be good if you have 1000 equations in 1000 unknowns. Once you start going into 10,000, 20,000, 1, 1 lakh equations in 1 lakh unknowns you have problems. Okay, You still get into roadblocks of time constraints. You can use iterative methods and we will talk about iterative methods. So, iterative methods are you start with a guess solution and then try to converge to the close to the true solution as quickly as possible. Uh, again uh, iterative methods we have to look at uh, when you are guessing and trying to go to a solution you should know whether you will converge or not ok. So, under what conditions you will converge is going to be one of the main uh, themes. Uh, there are also optimization based methods which are again iterative methods I will briefly touch upon optimization based methods. And then finally, I will also talk about a fundamental thing what is ill conditioned systems and well conditioned systems. So, how do you classify A x equal to B? Uh, well, it depends upon this A matrix. So, we will we'll talk about properties of A matrix like a condition number uh, in detail. I suppose you may have been introduced to this idea of condition number, but I will derive the, the basic ideas that lead to a condition number. And we will talk about well conditioned matrices, ill conditioned matrices. When the matrices are ill conditioned, you cannot get reliable solutions through numerical computations, and you should be aware of that. Because nowadays you have tools, you know, you just give a matrix, it will pop out a solution. You should know whether the solution makes sense or not. Okay. One is from physics viewpoint, other is from computation viewpoint. If the matrix is ill conditioned, okay, you cannot get a good solution, and you should know, should be aware of that. Okay, so let us begin by talking about uh, existence of solutions. When does the solutions exist? B lies in the column space of A. So, there are two actually pictures, there are two geometric pictures that are typically used. I will just use this. You should, you should actually uh, look at a book by Gilbert Strang. He gives very, very nice introduction to solution of linear algebraic equations. This is example from Gilbert Strang. I am just taking one simple example 
which is 2 minus 1, 1, 1, x, y is equal to 1 and 5. Okay. Now, there are two viewpoints by which you can geometrically visualize the solution. Well, one viewpoint which is taught in our schools is, uh, you know, two lines intersecting or when it goes to three variables in three unknowns, we talk about three planes intersecting at one point and so on. In general, we can say that hyperplanes intersecting. So, one viewpoint I would say is this, that is 2 minus 1 x y is equal to 1. This is equation number 1 and second equation is 1 1 x y is equal to 5. Okay. So, this is the, we would say that well, so we draw these two lines and you know we, we this is this is my x y plane this is a uh, very commonly given uh, example. So, uh, this line is 2 x minus y is equal to 1 and the other line is uh, x plus y is equal to 5 and then this line and this line intersects at this point this is the solution okay commonly one example means not this particular example but intersecting lines is or intersecting planes uh, so this is the solution that's what we know the other interpretation is of course the column space interpretation which is uh, coming from vector addition so, I could view this equation as 2 minus 1 or oh sorry 2 1 times x plus uh, y times y times minus 1 1 is equal to 1 5. Okay? This is the second equation and here we are not drawing pictures in x y plane any longer. x and y are coefficients by which these two vectors add to give you the third vector. So, this is your vector addition, this is your vector addition okay. and this picture is I will call this as, so this is row picture. Row picture becomes very, very difficult to visualize in some sense beyond three dimensions. Okay. But my claim is that the column picture is a little easier to visualize after three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions. We are just talking about linear combination of vectors. So, here what we are saying is we have these two vectors, we have this vector 1 minus 1, and I have this another vector. This is my vector 2 1, this is my vector 1 minus 1 okay? and then my third vector is this 1 5 we are just trying to use the, the law of vector additions okay? and then you can complete the geometric picture by drawing the parallelogram here. So, actually it is just linear combination of these two vectors gives me the third vector okay? gives me the third vector and when will you when will you be able to get solution for any right hand side when if you want to specify any right hand side okay, then the linear combination of the columns put, should span the entire space that means that means these two these two should be linearly independent. If these are linearly independent, all possible linear combinations of these two vectors will span R2 and then any vector. Well, there will be a problem if suppose if this was 
if this was 2 minus 2, suppose I change this equation to 2 minus 2, what is the trouble? These two are, these two are vectors in the same direction, okay. No linear combination of these two vectors can ever give me 1, 5, okay. So, the column picture would say that equation does not have a solution. That is because you, you have one equation, you have two vectors which are aligned along the same direction. There is no linear combination which is ever going to give me this vector, okay. No linear combination is ever going to give me this vector. So, so now when column picture tells you that there is no solution, same thing will happen for row picture. If you take row picture here, okay, for this change case, you will see that there are no two different lines. See, there are parallel lines which will never meet. So, 2 x minus y is equal to 1 and minus 2 x plus y is equal to 5. So, this will be the row picture and you will get two lines which never which never intersect, okay. So, when when this when this picture shows that there is a problem, you cannot get a solution. The row picture also will give you a problem, there is no solution. No hyperplanes meet or no planes or no uh, lines meet, okay. We can generalize this to uh, any n dimensional case, we can talk about linear combinations of column giving you a solution which lies in the column space, okay. And, and uh, row picture will be hyperplanes and then the solution when it exists is all the hyperplanes meet in one point, okay. So, actually line is a one dimensional hyperplane in two dimensional space, plane is a two dimensional hyperplane in three dimensional space and in four dimensional space there will be a three dimensional hyperplane and so on and those three dimensional hyperplane should meet, well difficult to visualize how three dimensional planes meet at one point, but uh, easier to look at the column picture and talk about linear combinations of columns in n dimensional spaces, okay. So, we will not uh, get beyond a certain point here. Uh, what is important is because all of you know this, I am just revising this very quickly. Um, when does the solution exist? Solution exists when the columns are linearly dependent, in independent, okay. And uh, same thing is true about rows, if the columns are linearly independent, the rows are linearly independent. And number of, the fundamental theorem of linear algebra is number of linearly independent rows equal to number of linearly independent columns is equal to rank of the matrix, okay. So, with this brief brush off, we will just get onto the uh, solving problems using, okay. Now, Gaussian elimination is something which I am not going to touch upon because I assume that you already have a sufficient background of Gaussian elimination. I have uploaded some notes on Gaussian elimination. You should have a look at those notes. I just want to compare two things here to begin with to give a motivation for methods which are more efficient. One is uh, number of computations that are number of multiplications and divisions that are involved. So, two methods that you know for solving Ax equal to b, the first method you learn is Kramer's rule, okay. The first method that you learn is Kramer's rule. Now, I am going to use this psi to denote number of required to arrive at the solution. If psi represents the number of multiplications and divisions that are required to arrive at the solution, then for Kramer's rule psi estimated is approximately equal to, I am talking about n cross n matrix. So, my concern here is A is in general an n cross n matrix where n could be large, okay. Uh, 
n could be 1000, 10,000 or whatever a large number and we have seen that these kind of matrices arise when you do let us say finite difference method problem discretization of boundary value problem a two dimensional boundary value problem will give rise to even if you take 100, 100 grid points okay, along x and y you will get a huge matrix which, which has to be solved. So, uh, large matrices are not uncommon when you do uh, approximate solution. So, here it comes out to be n minus 1 into n plus 1 into n factorial plus n which is approximately or this is equal to this is exactly equal to which is approximately equal to n square into one minute. this is n factorial plus n uh, this is n square into n factorial okay estimated number of operations divisions and multiplications for Kramer's rule I am not going to derive this you just accept this number right now I am just going to give you a estimate of what can happen if you try to use Kramer's rule for a matrix of moderate size 100 by 100 okay if you take n equal to 100 okay this data I have taken from Professor S. K. Gupta's book so this is you can show that this psi is close to 10 to the power 162 okay and he says that a deck computer uh, deck 1090 would take 10 to the power 149 years to solve this problem okay so absurd number so to solve a problem of 100 cross 100 matrix involving 100 cross 100 matrix uh, using uh, Kramer's rule is un is impossible okay a computer would take the, the deck computer when he probably wrote the book was the fastest one and then he has given this uh, number that it would take 10 to the power 149 years okay so Kramer's rule is ruled out it is just good for you know 10, 10 standard or 12 standard whatever wherever you learn it and good for solving 3 equations in 3 unknowns maybe 4 equations if you have patience to do determinants then so this is not a way to go certainly not the way to go what about Gaussian elimination Gaussian elimination seems to be the hope here so in Gaussian elimination we start with ax equal to b then we transform it to an upper triangular matrix u x is equal to b prime or b cap let us call it we transform by elimination we transform it to an upper triangular matrix and then we do the backward sweep okay so what is the number of operations that you need here the number of operations that you need here is n cube plus 3 n square minus n by 3 which is approximately for a large n which is approximately equal to n cube by 3 so uh, n cube by 3 is far 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 less than you know n factorial so this the reason why Gaussian elimination is so popular and is a computer savvy method is because this is uh, one of the most efficient ways by which you can solve ax equal to b okay so that's why it is introduced right at uh, 10 standard or 12 standard and then you start building on it as you go uh, into your higher grades okay so now so obviously we want to we want to work with gaussian elimination okay and now what i want to do is before I move to iterative methods, I want to see whether Gaussian elimination can be made more efficient okay, by exploiting certain structures that appear in discretization, problem discretization. So at some, some time back when we did this discretization, I told you that uh, finite difference or orthogonal collocations, you know, or orthogonal collocations on finite element and so on, we get some special matrices these are called as sparse matrices sparse matrices are ones which are filled with large number of zeros and they may have some nice structures 
okay. If you exploit these structures, okay, you can come up with direct methods or uh, so these, these methods which I am talking about, these are classified as direct methods, okay. Why, when I say direct methods, uh, as against iterative methods, iterative methods in which you start with a guess and from the old guess you construct a new guess and so on, okay like newton raphson the iterative method direct methods in gaussian elimination you don't start with a guess right you directly solve the problem okay other variants of gaussian elimination are gauss jordan method okay lud composition so all these are variants of gaussian elimination but basically the the foundation is gaussian elimination okay also i have uploaded something about lud composition lud composition is gaussian uh, elimination represented as you know sequence of two triangular matrices, uh, mat tri triangular matrix calculations, one is upper triangular, other is a lower triangular. So you can have LU decomposition also, you can you can have a look at LU decomposition, but that is derived from Gaussian elimination. So uh, the order of computations are again of the order of n cube by 3, it is not, not too different. Okay. So uh, in direct methods, now what we are going to look at is direct methods for solving when i say direct method not the kramer's rule of course the gaussian elimination okay sparse linear systems are those set of equations ax equal to b where matrix a has large number of zeros and i want to exploit spatial structure of uh, that matrix A to come up with a efficient solution which will significantly reduce the number of multiplications and divisions that you need for solving the problem. Okay, that is the motivation for these sparse methods. Again, in this course, I cannot do a justice to sparse methods. I am just going to introduce you to sparse methods. Okay, uh, everything is a iceberg, and we just touch the tip of the iceberg. If you look at sparse method. In, Mat in MATLAB, there is a sparse matrix toolbox and it will list so many, you know, algorithms. I cannot cover all of them. But what is important is to sensitize you that there exists something called sparse methods and you should look at, you should try to see whether there is a nice structure in your problem which can be exploited to reduce the computations. That is what is more important. So, uh, I am going to touch upon three or four methods uh, and we will move on to something else. Uh, but at least this will give you flavor of what it is, what is this pass matrix business. Okay. So we are going to look at uh, some things which are some uh, matrices, some sparse matrices. This is one is tridiagonal. And block tridiagonal matrices. We will look at block diagonal matrices, we will look at, uh, well in general one can talk about banded matrices. So banded matrices with only m diagonals, okay, I am not going to touch upon this, I will talk about these two, uh, then I will uh, also mention about triangular matrices, block triangular matrices. So these are the some, these are some nice forms. Actually, if you start looking at these forms, uh, just in the linear algebra textbook, you might wonder where do I get all these forms, but all these forms appear in problem discretization. Okay. And uh, once we write some of these forms, you will realize where they appear and how you, uh, so the motivation for these looking at these past matrices becomes clear if you look at the problem discretization methods, okay. Those will give you these uh, nicely patterned matrices which you can actually exploit to come up with efficient solutions. Let us look at first the, the simplest one I would say is block diagonal matrix. A block diagonal matrix would appear, a 
block diagonal matrix will appear in orthogonal collocations on finite elements OCFE. Uh, a block diagonal matrix would look something like this. Well, this original equation which is Ax equal to b, I am writing it in a block diagonal matrix form. Okay, here a1, a2 up to am are matrices which are full, they are not, they are, they do not have too many zeros. These matrices are typically dense matrices, not sparse matrices, but all these square zeros are actually matrices of appropriate dimension which contain only zeros. So, this is a sparse matrix because non zero, non zero elements appear along these diagonals appear along these diagonals and then here this is a dense matrix this is a dense matrix this is a dense matrix but all these are zero matrices null matrices so this is a huge matrix filled with large number of zeros only here on the diagonal you have some small sub matrices which are dense okay the small sub matrices which are dense what I have done here x, x here I have partitioned here okay. I will talk about this partitioning uh, very soon and even b vector I am partitioning into b1, b2, b3 and b4. Okay. Now what are these partitions? What are these partitions? Well my matrix Ai is actually a matrix which is n i cross n i ok. So, this could be see this could be a 3 cross 3 matrix, this could be a 5 cross 5 matrix, next one could be a 3 cross 3 matrix. If you are doing orthogonal collocations on finite elements, on the first element you take 3 internal collocation points, next one you take 5 internal collocation points and so on, you will get this matrices of different dimensions only these matrices on the diagonal are dense because if you remember when you do orthogonal collocations on finite elements only variables in that small segment appear appear in that equation okay so you have this funny structure that you will get well will you get this or you will get some overlap probably in uh, OCFE you may not get exactly this structure, you might get some overlapping uh, and you will have to do some, some more tricks to uh, bring it to this form. Okay, But there are some applications where you get this nice banded structure and then each one of them is a ni cross ni matrix. This vector xi, xi belongs to R ni, so it is a ni dimensional vector. Okay, and same is true about vector b i which belongs to R n i. So, these are subsystems, these are subsystems which are arranged in a diagonal form. Okay. Now, what do I do when I want to solve this? Well, one way is the brute force is take this entire matrix and use Gaussian elimination. Okay. I can use Gaussian elimination on this entire matrix. Okay. So, what is n here? Total n. My total n is summation i goes from 1 to m n i. Right? My total n, all number of, how many number of, what is the dimension of this entire matrix? n cross n. What is n? See, these are all subsystems. I am just adding them. So, the entire matrix, this entire matrix is n cross n, where n is equal to summation of all n i. Okay? These are n i subsystems which I want to solve together. So, if I use Gaussian elimination here directly, then the number of uh, multiplications and divisions 
if i use one without without trying to exploit the structure of this matrix if i try to use blanket gaussian elimination then number of divisions and multiplications we just listed this will be n cube plus 3 n square minus n divided by 3 the other option is i could solve subsystems so i could solve for a i x i is equal to b i i going from 1 to m i have this m subsystems okay i could solve each small sub problem okay see this this is 3 by 3 or 4 by 4 or you know each one of them is a smaller smaller dimensional system i can solve this each one of them using gaussian elimination okay now what is the what is psi i what is psi i here that will be n i cube plus 3 n i square minus n i by 3 right so this n i are 3 4 5 you know these are smaller dimensional matrices whereas this one this this matrix is a large matrix this matrix is a large matrix which has large number of rows and columns so instead of using a gaussian elimination on entire one if i do this trick of solving each subsystem separately then the total number of total number of this thing is uh, sigma n i cube plus 3 n i square minus n i by 3 is actually far far less than this will be far far less than this because see what is n n is summation n i summation n i cube will have lot many terms than okay so this simple trick of identifying sub blocks which are dense and solving those sub blocks okay can actually reduce your computations multiple folds okay so within gaussian elimination also if you are instead of instead of solving one giant problem in which there are lots of zeros and you are going to waste time in eliminating zeros because there are already zeros in, in what you do in gaussian elimination you first make it load upper triangular matrix so you have to bring zeros and then if you just apply gaussian elimination without thinking you will waste time in bringing zeros from zeros doesn't make any sense and uh, but the computer will just do computations without you know understanding that there is a zero there so you have to tell the computer well there are zeros don't worry about those zeros just do these subsystem calculations and then you can solve the problem much more efficiently than okay so uh, this is very very important particularly when you have iterative calculations suppose you have to solve ax equal to b kind of equations inside a newton raphson where a has this banded structure then you know just imagine see when you are doing this repeatedly say 1000 times or 10000 times well you better solve it efficiently okay so suppose this ax of ax equal to b this banded structure appears inside a loop okay iterative loop okay each time if you do these many calculations that is much more expensive than doing these many calculations okay that's where this banded matrix structure helps well the next one we are going to look at is the thomas algorithm okay so the thomas algorithm is for a special case of thomas algorithm maybe some of you have done this in your undergraduate because it is often taught so thomas algorithm is for block is first for uh, tri diagonal matrices okay i am going to write this uh, notation i am going to change a little bit here the right hand side this elements i am going to call them as d1 d2 dn my matrix is now going to be written with b1 c1 0 then a2 b2 c2 0 then 0 a3 b3 c3 0 
So this is a tridiagonal matrix. You have zeros here, and then finally you will get a n b n. So you have this b one, b two, b three up to b n. That is the main diagonal. Okay. There is one more diagonal above this, which is c one, c two, c three, and one more diagonal below this. A two, A three. So this starts from A two. This starts from one, but this ends here at C n minus one, and this starts from A two, ends in n. You have seen this kind of a matrix, finite difference method. You have seen this kind of a matrix. Okay. So in finite difference method, you get this tridiagonal matrix. Okay. And then question is, question is, can I? Exploit the spatial structure. This has so many zeros filled with so many zeros. How many elements are non-zero? Three n minus two. Three n minus two. N elements of diagonal. N minus one of first diagonal above and n minus one of first diagonal below. So three n minus two elements are non-zero. Rest all elements are zero. Okay, so I am going to do simple Gaussian elimination here. Can you do it? Can you try this? How will you do Gaussian elimination? You should just eliminate. I don't have to do Gaussian elimination for these elements here. I just have to eliminate a two. Okay, when I come here, I just have to eliminate a three. Okay, and so on. So I just have to eliminate one element below the diagonal, main diagonal. Okay, that will give me a upper triangular matrix, and then I just go on doing the backward sweep. So if we just write the steps here, it will be something like this. So I'm going to define this gamma one, which is C one by B one. I'm just writing it algorithmically. What I'm doing is basically Gaussian elimination. Okay, and Gamma k is equal to c k b k minus a k gamma k minus one uh this is for k equal to 2 3 up to n minus 1 then i have this beta 1 is equal to d1 by b1 and beta k is equal to dk by dk minus a k beta k minus 1 bk so what i have written here it looks uh probably at the first sight little complex but all that i am doing is eliminating eliminating one element below the diagonal okay and these gamma and and beta are the elements which appear in the so what i am doing is after doing this doing these operations i am going to get this new matrix which looks like this this new matrix looks this new matrix after doing all this will look something like this 1 gamma 1 0 0 0 1 gamma 2 0 of course you have this matrix x here a uh, vector x here and the right hand side is right hand side is beta 1 beta 2 beta n this uh equations written here are for computer implementation you can put it in a for loop and just do calculations to get this matrix this is 
this is just these are the steps of Gaussian elimination written in an algorithmic way so that you can put it in the computer program too. So now I get this matrix this is upper triangular matrix when you do upper triangular matrix here you just have to worry about one row above the diagonal right and now what do you do backward sweep okay you do backward sweep you get x1 directly from this x2 you get right all of you know back substitution so now I do backward sweep and then solve the problem what is the number of multiplications and divisions that are required in Thomas algorithm this is called Thomas algorithm now I will do backward sweep on this should I write those equations or you are clear about it I think all of you know about this right how do you solve from this it's very very simple ok what is the, the point to take home is that number of multiplications and divisions for this case reduced to 5n minus 8 this is just linear function of n as against cubic function of n if I were to use if I were to use Gaussian elimination without thinking about the structure I would be doing n cube by 3 calculations roughly here I just do 5n minus 8 significantly lower than what I need to do as you know by normal Gaussian elimination so Thomas algorithm is one example where you significantly reduce the computations required by exploiting the structure the next what we are going to see is of course a simple extension of this is if you have this I will do in the, my next class is what if see here we have looked at this algorithm where a b c are scalars what if these are matrices what if b is a mat b1 is a matrix c1 is a matrix a2 is a matrix b2 is a matrix those things are those matrices are called as uh, block tridiagonal matrices ok block tridiagonal matrices so we just simply extend this idea to block tridiagonal matrices and still we can do much less computations than doing entire solving the entire thing ok so that is what is going to be the next extension so these are some of the well known sparse matrix algorithms and you can significantly reduce the computations even in Gaussian elimination we are still doing Gaussian elimination we are not graduated to something new ok so we will continue on more of this in my in the next lecture.